Hello! Welcome to another episode of Ancient Office Hours by the Ozymandias Project. Trireme Transit is now boarding for all new and returning passengers. Now departing, present ponderings. Next stop is Ancient Office Hours at a library lost in the sands of time. Hey everyone, and welcome to episode 84 of Ancient Office Hours. This week, my guest is Dr. John Hyland, a professor of ancient history at Christopher Newport University. His research examines Achaemenid Persian imperialism and interactions with the Greek city-states. He is the author of Persian Interventions, the Achaemenid Empire, Athens and Sparta, 450 through 386 BCE, and his forthcoming projects include Brill's Companion to War in the Ancient Iranian Empires, as well as a history of Persia's Greek campaigns. In this episode, we discuss his path into classics via Herodotus and moving into military history of the Persian Empire, take a deep dive into Sparta's relationship with Persia, and examine how Persian culture gets lost in translation in media adaptations of Persia-focused material. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and if you like what you hear, please give us a five-star rating and review us on Apple or Spotify. You can also subscribe to our Patreon, as this will allow us to reach more people and make more exciting ancient world content. Enjoy! Great. Thanks so much for joining me, John. It's been, it's a pleasure to have you on. And so I want to get us started with what I hope will be a very simple question, which is, how old were you, or when do you remember first getting into the ancient world? Hi, Lexi. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm happy to to talk today. I really got fascinated with ancient history when I was uh, just a a little kid. My dad is also a a classicist and uh, had a long career as a a, a Latin teacher. And when I was in kindergarten, uh, he was studying for uh, grad school Greek exams, and he would read me uh, stories from Herodotus's histories uh, as bedtime stories uh, while, while he was studying. The stories about Greeks and Persians started speaking to me then, and, and I always kind of had that fascination from that point on with learning more about this huge empire and how, how it interacted with the cities of Athens and Sparta uh, out on its frontiers. And then over uh, time, I came back to it at, at various points in life. I started reading a lot of Persian and Greek history while I got really into military history in, in high school. Eventually in college, I started taking Greek history classes and Greek language classes. And the more I studied the Greeks, the more I found out that I really wanted to study the Persians. The Persian Empire was always the large state that the small Greek city-states were dealing with. Um, it was always part of the picture Uh, for the Greek world. That eventually led me to chase down opportunities in grad school to study the Persian Empire in its own right, and also how it interacted with the Greeks. That's so awesome. Now, I know that you trend toward the Persians, but when you were an undergrad, was it easy to find classes? Was it hard? And actually, did you have, did you start building this interest even before undergrad? Like, did you search for books or comics or movies, anything that also included the Persians? I did. So when I was in high school, uh, I was really interested in uh, military history. Again, I I had grand designs in high school of writing a a history of warfare, a a multi-volume work that would cover the the whole scope of world history, little stuff. So I actually read a decent bit about ancient Persia starting in high school. I I was reading Herodotus and Xenophon and some of the Alexander historians uh, in translation. Again, everything was kind of starting with this interest in military encounters. And then gradually, the more I read, the more it it opened up my eyes to the the larger world and and cultures of Persia. In undergrad, uh, I had a great history class my freshman year uh, with Professor Barry Strauss at, at Cornell. And it was a class about democracy and war that compared the Peloponnesian War in ancient Greece with the early Cold War dynamics and the Korean War in the 1950s, and basically was looking at Athens and the United States, uh, as well as South Korea, uh, and how they responded under pressure, and how did democracies adjust to the difficulties of uh, wartime situations. That was kind of my college entry point. And from then on, I took more Greek history classes. There weren't specifically Persian history classes offered at that point at Cornell. 
but Barry encouraged me to write Persian-centered papers and then eventually a senior thesis that was focused on Persia and it, its Greek interactions. So a lot of that was hunting the various texts through the libraries and haunting their library room that had all of the early print fascicles of the Encyclopedia Iranica. And I remember you know, collecting various things. Pierre Briant's Histoire de l'Empire Perse came out early when I was an undergrad. Uh, and Professor Strauss told me, you know, you need to read this. I didn't read French yet because I had taken German for my other language. Uh, so some of my first experience practicing French with a friend who studied French uh, was going through passages that I needed to read from this book and uh, working on short translations. So it, it was a lot of, you know, independent work to talk to people who knew something and chase things down. And then I was really lucky to find a graduate school program at Chicago that was wonderfully interdisciplinary and that combined my interests in the Persian world and the Greek world, uh, but really gave me formal coursework and, and training uh, on the Persian side. Did you ever have any doubts? Did you ever sit down and think, you know, it's really hard to find Persian material. Not a lot of people are, are doing it. And I mean, I know, obviously, when we find something that we love, yeah, we get really excited and we, we would like to do it. But sometimes the reality sort of, you know, puts the kibosh on that. So while you were very excited, did you ever kind of think maybe this is not the best idea? Because this is really not the easiest path to, to, to follow. You know, I never really did. I think I was always excited by the idea of saying something new. The more I read books about the Persian Greek Wars or books about Persia's role in the Peloponnesian War, the more I got inspiration from certain books, but I wasn't ever finding the book that really fully answered the questions that I wanted to ask. I think it was more of this driving sense of curiosity. The, the more that I read in the field, the more I had the sense that there's so many conversations to be had. The material is out there to interpret Persian-Greek relations in, in new ways. That being said, I did take a, a long time to find more Persian sources or, or to recognize how Persian sources could speak to some of the questions that I wanted to, to ask. Uh, so I think I started out trying to read Greek historians against the grain, trying to read Herodotus or read especially Xenophon and Thucydides for my dissertation in ways that challenged older stereotypes of a Greek cultural supremacy at, at the root of Western civilization. You know, I was, I was bothered by things that I was finding in the older scholarship. And so I started with the idea that we just need to ask better questions and we need to put aside these biases and come at these texts in new ways to pull out their inner kernels, as, as uh, Pierre Briant had said. Then eventually, I was exposed to a, a whole variety of Persian documentary sets of evidence, the Persepolis fortification tablets, or the letters from the archive of Arshama, a Persian governor of Egypt uh, in the late 400s BCE. And reading those texts in grad school was an exciting but sometimes overwhelming experience. You're just being bombarded with thousands of documents. And it didn't come naturally at first to figure out how to how to use those because they weren't giving me a narrative history, a description of King Xerxes went to Greece and did this. And this is different from what Herodotus said. And so I was still starting out taking the Greek texts and trying to see if we could read between the lines. It was really later, it was after I became a, a professor at Christopher Newport University, I started coming back to the documentary material, but also there were a lot of really inspirational publications coming out, say 2005 to, to now and, and ongoing. Uh, and it was kind of engaging with this growing mass of Persian studies literature that was more confident in using Persian sources, using comparative materials from Assyria and Babylonia and other Near Eastern powers, and kind of putting together the narratives for what a certain king might have done with the documents that show you how empire works in a nitty gritty day to day kind of way. So that's sort of what I'm chasing now is that that ability to interrogate a Greek story and put it in context by asking, you know, how would this work on the ground? What does it mean for a king 
to go from Iran to Greece in terms of the Persian worldview, but also how would you feed people? How would you deal with the practicalities of moving a court and an army from the center of an empire to a frontier? And so in terms of studying warfare, there's there's a couple of different dimensions to this, right? Because when I think of Persian studies, or when most people think of it, you think, okay, so there must be literature, there's this long literary tradition. But when thinking about sort of the material side, you know, I don't know how much people would assume there is left versus how much you would get from the archaeological side, uh, we can't go to Iran. You can go to places in Greece where the Persians were. But when you wanted to go into military history, was that challenging? Was it? Were there more resources available if you wanted to go and become like a philologist in Greco-Persian studies? Or was it quite not as hard as I'm imagining it was to, to go into the military side? Going into the military side, the, the greatest challenge is the lack of the uh, narrative kind of evidence like royal annals or chronicles from, from the Achaemenid Persian kings uh, to give a Persian version of the Greek wars. Uh, and there are also challenges in the scarcity of documents that deal directly with soldiers or with military campaigns. By comparison, from the Assyrian Empire, we have thousands of letters that deal explicitly with issues of military supply and intelligence gathering, uh, recruitment of soldiers, skirmishing along frontiers. And we don't have a lot of that kind of material for uh, the, the Achaemenid Persian Empire. But on the other hand, the more I looked into it, there is a lot of evidence that's relevant that hasn't been fully appreciated as, as such. For example, we see people in the Persepolis fortification archives known as spear bearers. This corresponds with a Greek title, Dorophoroi, or spear bearers, that's used for bodyguards of the king and, and people who seem connected to a, a palace military corps. In the Persepolis tablets, they're not on a campaign. Uh, these are administrative records. They're basically the day-to-day -day receipts of uh, empire in one region of the empire, in, in Fars, in southern Iran. And the spear bearers who show up in these texts aren't fighting battles. They're not using their spears that we can see. Instead, they're engaged in accounting missions. Um, they're going to villages. They're registering groups of people. They are sometimes moving uh, ahead of the king during royal progresses through Iran uh, and inspecting roadways. Uh, they're doing all of this activity that looks mundane on the surface. Uh, and as a result, the scholarship was slow to recognize them or, or careful uh, to avoid overemphasizing them as soldiers. But when you look at comparative materials, uh, you actually see that people in the Assyrian empire uh, who show up in a, a wider corpus of military documentation. There are people who belong to several different components of a palace army. When they're at home in the capitals, they're doing all of these other things. They're engaged in tax collection and inspection and uh, various uh, tasks connected to estate management of elites because the royal army isn't fighting most of the time. Most of the time, these people have a social role. Seeing some of the new scholarship and, and being able to get into some of the texts in transcription as well uh, in the Elamite language uh, and to see some of this material for soldiers in the imperial heartland, it helped to contextualize the few occasions when they actually go off on a frontier campaign. It's pretty rare that the king would go to war, but you know, when he does, he's taking this group of soldiers with him who also have these other functions. Uh, and that helps make them an ideal audience for royal performance uh, and royal spectacle when the king and this group of palace personnel uh, go out to a frontier. So then you find lots of other pieces of evidence. There's visual evidence from images of soldiers. There are pieces of uh, material evidence, uh, such as scales from uh, iron or bronze scales from armor iron spearheads or bronze arrowheads that are found at Iranian archaeological sites. 
but also sometimes siege or battle sites in Turkey and Greece. A lot of the material is has been known on the arms and armor side since the middle or early part of the 20th century, uh, but is scattered in museum collections and hasn't received the same focused level of study that the comparable Greek arms and armor have. So writing the book on uh, the Persian invasions of Greece, actually I found it a pleasant surprise how much material there is and how much scattered scholarship on pieces of the material there is. And it, it provided an opportunity to try to bring all of this together, written texts, uh, images, uh, material artifacts, all of them can be put together like puzzle pieces to give us a bigger part of a, the Persian story. That's really, really awesome, because I definitely don't think I at all at all realized what would be out there to study, especially from the Persian side. I mean, yes, from the from the Greek side, we, we do have a lot of material culture and other things to study. So it's fascinating to hear about something that I don't really hear about that much. So in keeping with the evidence and the fact that there is so much more within studying the military side for the Persians, I know a lot of your research deals with the Persian relationship with the Spartans, which is also something that we, or I at least, don't know or think about beyond sort of what we see in 300 with Leonidas saying no to earth and water. So can you tell us briefly, like, what is the actual nature of their relationship? What is it that you've uh, uncovered for us that we all need to know about the wider sort of Spartan-Persian relationship? The Persian-Spartan relationship is fascinating and is so much more complex, even in the years 480 to 479 BCE, than just the Battle of Thermopylae or the, the mythologizing of whatever happened at Thermopylae. Uh, which started with Simonides and Herodotus in the 5th century and has continued and spun off in lots of modern ways. Sparta was the largest territorial city-state uh, on the Greek mainland, or what I like to call trans-Aegean Greece from the Persian point of view. It's Greece across the water as opposed to the homes of the Greeks on this side of the water uh, in what's now Western Turkey. Um, Sparta was the largest territorial a Greek city-state, uh, but had a relatively small population, uh, which was outnumbered by people who were excluded from citizen rights, or uh, and also by a large enslaved population, uh, the Helots, uh, who lived throughout Spartan territory, and especially in the southwestern part of what's modern Greece. The uh, Spartans are outnumbered in terms of population by the other really big city-state in mainland Greece, uh, the city-state of Athens. But Sparta had a number of geographical and material disadvantages compared to Athens by the 5th century, the 400s BCE. On the one hand, the Spartans have a rich agricultural base, uh, and they have a reputation for warfare. They are fairly good at intimidating their neighbors and building a coalition of smaller city-states that are willing to follow them in wartime out of loyalty or compulsion. But they are an inland city. They have limited naval resources. They do have some uh, maritime trade, but they don't have a highly developed harbor infrastructure. Uh, and uh, Sparta's merchant connections with other parts of the Mediterranean are, are certainly on the decline by the 5th century BCE. Uh, unlike Athens, they don't have a local source of silver, uh, where the Athenians can draw and mint silver out of their own soil. Uh, Sparta has nothing comparable. And Sparta, by the 5th century BCE, had not adopted coinage, uh, which made it absolutely backwards compared to most uh, Greek city-states. So Sparta comes into the conflict between the Persian Empire and some of its Greek neighbors rather reluctantly and slowly. Uh, and in some sense, it's drawn in by a fear that it would lose its hegemonic influence over nearby Greek cities if the Persian Empire should play a stronger role in mainland Greece. The Spartans also have internal political 
difficulties. There are rivalries within the Spartan royal families in the late 500s and early 400s, which uh, also lead Sparta towards a confrontation with the Persians, kind of like Athens uh, at the, the same time period. Athens had founded a democracy in 507, and its former tyrant had fled to refuge in the Persian Empire. One former king of Sparta, a man named Demaratus, had been exiled from Sparta. Uh, supposedly, he had been uh, deposed from his kingship uh, under false pretenses when his rival, the other Spartan king, bribed the Delphic oracle to declare him uh, an illegitimate child. Uh, so Demaratus went off to the Persian Empire. Again, there's some concern in Sparta that maybe Demaratus would gain Persian support and be restored by force uh, to a position in Spartan politics. So there's a lot of reason for anxiety as the Persian Empire is uh, moving towards Greece. There's a fraught relationship between Athens and Sparta. Um, as Sparta had helped the Athenians expel their tyrant, but Athens then founded a democracy uh, and emphasized its own sovereignty rather than acting as a loyal member of Sparta's uh, client list. Uh, and Sparta and Athens had come very close to war before the Persian Empire invaded Greece. Uh, so they are not natural allies, and there's a lot of tension uh, in their relationship. They help each other as long as it's mutually beneficial. When Persia invaded the Greek mainland in 490 BCE, uh, it sent an expedition through the Greek islands and then towards Athens, uh, and that was repelled by Athens at the Battle of Marathon. Sparta had offered to help the Athenians, but sent its soldiers too late, and they show up after the battle. Ten years later, when a larger Persian expedition, led by the king himself, marches from Iran to Greece, Athens was looking for help, and it made a deal with Sparta. The Athenians had built a large fleet, and they were capable of committing more warships than any other Greek city to try to hold the Persian fleet at bay. They were willing to cooperate with Sparta and accept Spartan command on land and on sea, as long as Sparta would bring its friends in to help protect them. In exchange, Athens would bring its warships into the fight and help to keep Persian influence out of uh, mainland Greece. But that alliance was tense. It, it ended up succeeding in not in saving Athens from getting burned two years in a row, but it did succeed in inflicting defeats on the Persians and preventing the Persians from setting up pro-Persian rulers in Athens and in other parts of mainland Greece. As soon as King Xerxes went home, and as soon as Persian military forces pulled back to uh, what's now the uh, Turkish side of the Aegean, at that point, the Spartans and Athenians quickly quarrel and break up. Uh, Athens founds its own alliance system of Greek city-states around the northern and eastern Aegean and the islands, uh, and Sparta uh, backs out of this and, and ends up going a separate path. Eventually, over the decades, that led Sparta and Athens to make war on one another. And while Athens and Persia made peace by 449 BCE, in the Peloponnesian War, uh, several decades later, Sparta began asking Persia for funding to help it defeat the Athenians. Eventually, this Athenian versus Spartan conflict was resolved by Persian intervention. And Persia came in, it provided not soldiers and ships, but financing to allow the Spartans to build a navy. Once the Athenians sank that navy, the Persians grumbled, but eventually provided more money. Uh, and finally, the Spartans were able, with Persian money, uh, to hire enough rowers to man their ships and defeat the Athenian navy uh, and end Athens' empire. Ultimately, Persia, uh, in 386 BCE, arbitrated a peace agreement in which Athens, Sparta, and other mainland Greek cities would be self-governing and would not subject other Greeks to imperial formations, uh, but Greeks in um, what they called Asia, uh, it's now, uh, again, Western Turkey, would remain under Persian imperial rule. So in the long run, the story is, is much more complex. Spartans fight Persians several times, 
but they're always looking to get something out of it. The battle at Thermopylae in 480 uh, is a precursor, which doesn't save Athens from being sacked and doesn't change the, the course of the invasion. Spartan troops do play a bigger military role in defeating a Persian occupation army at Plataea in 479. Uh, but decades later, the Spartans are absolutely happy to work with the Persians. Uh, and from a Persian point of view, I've argued that Sparta becomes a client state of the Persian Empire uh, by the late 400s and the early 300s BC. It's such a fascinating history. And I love that you gave us a very detailed narrative of what happened, because a lot of people are unable to sort of put things into context, because we do learn in sort of a truncated, jumpy manner where we do jump around and talk about big events. I remember myself being a student, and we sort of separated, and I don't know why, but we sort of separated and we spent like a couple weeks at the beginning of the semester really talking about the lead up to the initial Persian Wars. And then we kind of sped through everything after the Battle of Thermopylae and then suddenly popped back into history with the Sicilian expedition. It was, it was a really jumpy course. It's hard to put things into context, but now we know that the Spartans did band together and they did fight with the Athenians. And we also know that they did in this very unique ancient culture where it is not an example of a unified country. They were never all one Greece. We do know that they did band together to fight a big outside power, but it is very interesting that you mentioned that they did also end up working with what at the time of the Peloponnesian War, I suppose, was like this big benevolent power just sort of kind of there hovering around, let's say. I don't even know. It, it was just kind of there. So... This also then smashes through the illusion that 300 and the, its sequel want us to believe. So can you run through, in terms of working with the Persians, if you're Sparta, we don't hear of Sparta having a navy. In terms of working with the Persians, can you detail a little bit for us what the incentive would have been for Persia to work with Sparta if they wanted to sort of try to influence or control the region, which let's acknowledge is kind of a, on the very edge of their massive empire. I'm, I'm happy to talk about this. Um, there are a number of uh, components to the this bigger story of, of Persian Spartan naval diplomacy that need to be unpacked. From the Persian point of view, there's an ideological interest in portraying the empire as a uh, stretching to the ends of the earth. The, the kings of the Persian Empire present themselves as great kings, kings of kings, kings of lands of every sort, kings of lands near and far. And they present themselves as universal rulers uh, who have a mandate given by the god of Mazda to bring order out of chaos, to bring justice and peace and stability on the earth, if necessary, by force, by putting down disorder. That includes a sense that they need to rule the entire earth and the seas. And they inherit both Iranian cosmological ideas that have some connections with the world of the Avesta, uh, the later uh, Zoroastrian scriptures, but also old Mesopotamian concepts that imagined a world with surrounding band of seas and bodies of water. The Persian Empire is ringed by seas. It, it has access to the Mediterranean, the Aegean and the Black Sea, and the Red Sea in the West, uh, as well as uh, the Caspian and Persian Gulf. And the Persian kings display power. They live up to their symbolic claim for their rationale for rule um, by showing influence across the sea. But the way you do that can be flexible. Uh, and again, this is something I've, I dealt with in my first book and now in my second book, which is kind of the prequel. My first book was about the diplomacy and the idea that you can claim to rule the sea by accepting ambassadors and gifts from peoples on the far side. You don't have to have boots on the ground. My second book is looking at Xerxes' expedition where the king physically crosses the sea, building a navy, going to Athens. And 
engages in a very visceral power display through military force. But uh, again, that idea of crossing the sea can happen in lots of ways. And, and over time, there's a shift from military display to more diplomacy and patronizing clients, uh, again, giving financial subsidies to powers that are then going to be friendly to the, the empire. So Persia had developed a working relationship with Athens after the peace of 449 and into the 430s and 420s BCE, there are merchants sailing back and forth between Athens and Piraeus on the one hand and the Phoenician city-states or Cyprus or Egypt, which are all part of the Persian empire. So the Persians are benefiting from that naval trade. They're benefiting from, uh, ironically, from a fairly stable uh, Aegean Sea for a couple of decades where Athens is unchallenged. And uh, this increases levels of shipping and trade, and it's beneficial to the Persian Empire. From the Persian point of view, where the Athenians depict themselves as resisting tyranny and keeping out this giant foreign empire they see as barbarian, from the Persian point of view, uh, I've argued that the Athenians are essentially a client. They send periodic embassies to the Persian royal court, and they trade with Persia, and that trade gets taxed, and some Athenian silver coinage goes into Persian treasuries. That Athenian-Persian economic relationship was badly damaged by the Peloponnesian War. The increasing violence harmed naval trade. And then Athens, which had been doing well against Sparta, threw away a lot of its naval power in an ill-judged attempt to conquer Sicily, 415 to 413 BCE. It's right after that when Athens looks like it's going to collapse and its small Greek naval empire is going to fall apart. It's right at that moment that Persia offers funding to Sparta. Up until that time, Sparta had fought Athens for more than a decade, but had been unable to get decisive results. It couldn't beat Athens' ships on the water, and it couldn't use ships to blockade Athens and cut off its overseas food supply. The only way the Spartans could do that was to build a navy with most of the ships coming from other allied Greek city-states that didn't like Athens, places like Corinth or Thebes. You put together this coalition Peloponnesian rather than Spartan navy. But in order to have a chance to beat what's left of the Athenian navy, you have to be able to pay for supplies and food, and above all, pay your rowers. Athens paid rowers a good wage in silver, and rowers came not just from Athens, but from all over the Mediterranean uh, to get well-paying jobs rowing in the Athenian fleet. You could row for six weeks and earn enough silver to feed a family of four for a year. Sparta couldn't do that. It literally did not have coinage of its own. Uh, it could ask its allies for loans and voluntary contributions, but that wouldn't produce enough revenue to pay the rowers. And they had to pay huge numbers. A fleet of 100 triremes would have uh, 20,000 rowers that it, it needed to pay. And all of that silver adds up really, really fast. So that's where the Persian Empire, as the one large world power of the day, stretching from the Mediterranean uh, all the way to what's now Pakistan, the Persian Empire had monetary resources. And basically, it realizes that it can give these resources, help fund the Peloponnesian Navy until it achieves its goals. And in exchange, it can claim to bring peace and stability, but also gain a loyal client in one of the seas at the edge of the world. It's so interesting how I feel like the perception of Sparta, right, is that they want to be big man on campus, so to speak, and they don't really want help and they kind of like to run their own show. So it is quite interesting to hear how much they really did actually want to play ball with the Persians. Um, and in, in your opinion, you know, is, is it that they wanted to 
get the money and the help just because they wanted to be better than Athens or is it was was their motive more they wanted to just be sort of independent on and, and run their own show in the Peloponnese did they sort of want to work with the Persians to have a good relationship and sort of save that up for something else you know a little bit more into the the Spartan motivation now to to work with the Persians there was a great amount of political disarray at Sparta uh, and an enormous amount of controversy within the Spartan political system over those questions. You essentially have several factions emerging during the Peloponnesian War that have different visions of what a Spartan victory would look like and how much they're willing to sacrifice of Sparta's ideological claims in order to win. Uh, When it comes down to it, the majority of Spartan leaders are deeply pragmatic Uh, and care more about winning than they care about the values of freedom and liberation that they give lip service to. They go into this war claiming that they are fighting to liberate Greeks from an Athenian tyranny, which had gotten worse than the tyranny that the Persian Empire had threatened. But again, they're saying that while organizing initial embassies to Persia to ask for money. When they come into the Peloponnesian War, The price of the deal on the Persian side is the recognition that the Ionian Greeks, uh, that is all the Greeks in what's now Western Turkey, Western Anatolia, uh, would be under the Persian Empire. They would return to paying taxes to Persia instead of Athens, and Sparta would not interfere with that process. The Spartans made that deal without hesitation. There are stories of a handful of Spartan leaders who complain about the deal after it's been made and who prove bad at diplomacy with the Persians. But ultimately, the Spartans were willing to keep that deal if it helped them win. When Persia was distracted, uh, there are imperialists, uh, so to speak, in or in the Spartan government or in the high ranks of Spartan society who argue that we've won the war, Athens is defeated, now we can break away from Persia and basically go back on our deal and take the Ionian cities for ourselves. The Spartans attempted to do that from 399 to 394 uh, BCE. Persia had been distracted by a succession struggle and a civil war between two claimants for the Persian throne, Artaxerxes II, who became and stayed king, and his younger brother, Cyrus the Younger, uh, who wanted to be king in his place. The Spartans used the aftermath of that Persian succession war in order to uh, send some Spartan troops and the ships uh, that they had with their Peloponnesian War fleet to go and try to claim the leadership of the Ionian Greeks. They developed a propaganda rooted in uh, tenuous connections to Homer to try to justify this. They claim that it's a second Trojan War and that the Greeks are all going to stand together against the foreigners. At this point, uh, a king of Sparta, uh, Agesilaus, actually goes to Aulis, the place where the Greeks in the Trojan War myth had sacrificed the daughter of Agamemnon before going to Troy. And uh, he tries to sell this uh, united Greek vision of Greek warfare against Persia. Uh, the other Greeks are not buying it. Uh, and in fact, uh, that Spartan effort backfired. They don't do well. They managed to temporarily seize the coastal cities, but they can't compete. Uh, they can't keep up their navy without Persian funding. And their biggest naval components in Greece pull out and join a Persian-funded revolt against Sparta. Uh, so ultimately, Persia shows that it just has much deeper pockets uh, and it can call the shots. And Sparta ends up floundering in the diplomacy before it realizes that it has to make amends and apologize and go back to accepting Persia as an arbiter in the great world. Eh, life must have been so rough back then, especially for all these different powers jockeying for things. It sounds very Game of Thronesian. I am a little curious now. So the 300s really don't illuminate us to like 90 percent of this they're just meant to be entertainment i suppose from your perspective studying both military history the persians the spartans 
I'm curious to know, what do you make of the 300 film and its sequel, if you've decided to put yourself through watching that? Well, I've seen the original. I, I did not make it all the way through the sequel, although I've, I've looked at some scenes from it. It is often a point of reference, although not as often anymore, which I think is a good thing. It, when I was first teaching, I was, I think, in my second year of teaching at CNU when uh, the first 300 movie came out. And students went to see it. There was a lot of dialogue about it. A lot of students came into my classes on ancient Greece or ancient Persia with that as an initial point of reference. So it gave me a base to build on, to do some myth busting. Over time, it's something that has it's provided more and more opportunities for talking about how modern ideologies and especially um, modern Nazism and far-right nationalism takes toxic visions of the ancient world and, and uses them and puts them into their own propaganda. So we've really seen a lot of imagery from uh, the movie 300 being used for online radicalization, uh, being used for recruitment of people in white supremacist movements. It's been used by the Golden Dawn far-right terror group in Greece, as well as by a a whole laundry list of uh, racist and terrorist organizations in in the United States and elsewhere. It's had a an increasingly corrosive effect. On the other hand, it's it's certainly brought a lot of opportunities for scholars who look at this kind of material, at media and its uses and abuses of ancient history, uh, and it's given us a lot of opportunity to talk to students to think through not just what's inaccurate or what's problematic about what's being put on screen, but why is it being filmed in this way? And and how are these messages being used? What, what are the purposes that the deliberate skewing of ancient world uh, history uh, is being put to? So obviously, I, I find uh, many, many things troubling uh, about 300 and its subsequent legacy. But again, it, it provides an inspiration for the reason why it's so important to educate students about some of the realities and complexities of ancient history. I tell students in my introductory world history classes that studying history of any period, um, studying ancient history in my case, is an inoculation against the misinformation and the toxic nationalist abuses of history uh, that are so loud in our modern discourse. Certainly in the 20th century and 21st century, you have numerous cases of various dictators and authoritarians and, and violent nationalist movements cherry picking mythologized narratives of the past and using them for propaganda. It's essential for educated citizens of this country and citizens of the world to you know, have the, the curiosity to look deeper into the history and to have the basic literacy for how to engage with historical myths and to educate themselves and look beyond them. I think those are all very good points. So sure, I guess the film then serves as a good teaching tool interesting starting point now going forward right i think we're getting better and as we continue to move forward i think we will get better at more respectful hopefully more accurate representations now is there a story or particular event i guess that you would like to see covered or get more airtime or you know what i don't think i've seen anything on like the sicilian expedition really or ancient Persia and ancient Greece, there's, there's not a lot of crossover in media, I feel like, but so much of that history could lend itself to something really, really cool. And so I'm, I'm kind of curious, yeah, as someone who studies it, what would you like to see done? You know, I, I feel like you could make a real, the next Game of Thrones out of something. I think there are so many amazing stories to be told about ancient history. Uh, again, a lot of the history I work on is involved with diplomacy and, and high politics and, and warfare. And obviously there are many, many other uh, stories that, that can be told out of the ancient world that, that go beyond that. But I think I would love to see more complicated stories set in imperial borderlands, dealing with 
the complexities, not just a, a simple vision of Persians versus Greeks, but the complexities of worlds with so many different overlapping types of identity. And there are such great personal stories that can be told within that. Uh, I think the one that I my students respond to the most, thinking about the Peloponnesian War and the interplay between Athens and Sparta and the world of Sicily and the Persian Empire and the larger Mediterranean, is the story of Alcibiades. Uh, Alcibiades is the infamous Athenian general and diplomat and uh, bestie of Socrates, <laughs> bad boy and partier. And He's just a fascinating character. I use him in my Greek history course as a way of interrogating, beginning conversations on many different social history topics as well as political history ones. Uh, so we can use him to think about the Olympic Games. We can use him to think about the sometimes horrifying details of Athenian gender politics and, and uh, marriage. We can use him to look at, again, wartime relations between Athens and Sparta, but also he's fascinating because he's a character who is frequently on the run as a political exile and who's crossing boundaries or border regions between Athens, Persia, the Sicilian Greeks, uh, and Sparta. And the students always want more Alcibiades. And I always have one student uh, when I teach that class who says, why haven't they made a movie or an HBO series about this? You know, I, I think having a character who crosses between political uh, boundaries, but also uh, between different cultural zones would provide you know, a great opportunity to, to showcase the diversity and the, the fascination of so many different aspects of ancient culture. I feel like the ancient Greeks don't get their due in mass media outside the world of Greek mythology. We get the sense, you know, in, in books, in TV shows, in Hollywood, there's Greek mythology movies and you know, a handful of exceptions. Uh, and then Rome has this greater social profile that I think maybe comes partly out of Shakespeare and the and Shakespeare's Roman plays and, and their huge cultural resonance. But we really haven't had the storytelling in media that's resonated with the public that takes advantage of the amazing possibilities for ancient Greek history stories and for Persian history stories uh, that are you know, more complicated than the, the old fashioned narratives. I really hadn't thought of that until you mentioned that just now. I was because when you first said there hasn't there hasn't been any coverage of the ancient Greeks in mass media, I was about to be like, wait a minute, there's so many. But you're right. They really do trend mostly mythological because I now I'm sitting here thinking, OK, well, well, what have I watched recently? What do I know? Everything is either Homeric, which is mostly mythology. Yeah, we have a lot of like the Clash of the Titans again, Perseus mythology. Tragedy influence. Uh, you know, there are certain uh, Greek literature certainly had you know a massive influence. But again, you know, the, the straight. Greek history hasn't really been there. You you get you know a handful of things. You get the 1962 300 Spartans, and then the 2007 300. You get Alexander the Great movies. I think one in the 1950s, and then uh, the Oliver Stone one, 2004. But again, those are ones that sort of lend themselves yeah. to the mythology. No, treatment. you're so right. Oh my goodness, no, it's it's a bit crazy now. Now that makes me think that I was totally right in terms of since at least freshman year of undergrad, I've always thought to myself, I want to see a full HBO, Netflix, I don't care, but I want to see a full fleshed out series on Themistocles because I think he's so interesting. And yeah, uh, somebody has to go and make that. That would be a nice start. You know, I love that. And again, like I, we brought up the 300 sequel. I don't want to give it too much airtime, but one of the really frustrating things is that they seem to have shaped that around the character of Themistocles and again, made him boring. They, they don't get the complexity and the depth. And again, he's a character who crosses these different boundaries. There's not an iron curtain between Greece and Persia. And Themistocles can fight for Athens and help defeat the uh, Persian navy at the Battle of Salamis, but he's someone who ends up uh, as an exile in the Persian Empire, and then a very wealthy local magnate 
with his own estate issuing coins and paying taxes to the king of Persia. So again, it's much more complicated than this the simple East versus West, democracy versus monarchy. There's so many more subtle layers in between that make for better storytelling as well as better history. Yeah. No, I mean, and that's that's the thing that always grabbed me about the Mysticles when I took a whole class, not about him, but that time period. And I just remember thinking, how could you go from being the great hero of Salamis to literally spending your last years in the heart of Persia, the way they did Artemisia. I mean, it was all, it was all so bizarre. I shove it in its own corner, really, of media, quote unquote. But yeah, I don't know. There's there's so much more. I agree. Alcibiades is, <laughs> he would make for such a great series as well. I mean, we luckily saw him in the Assassin's Creed video game that they made. And they did a pretty good job, actually. But I've, I've heard wonderful things. I've seen some of the graphics. And it, yeah, it looks amazing. Oh, yeah. He's definitely portrayed uh, as the silly playboy who actually is smart, but very silly playboy. So we do have something on him, luckily, but we need more. And I agree we, we need more. But I am curious. And we've talked about all these borderline awful educational materials that we have seen done. But is there anything that stands out to you that you can think of that is a ancient world portrayal or something in media that we've seen done quite well, something that we would sit here as historians and say, actually, this, this wasn't just terrible. I don't know. I, again, I tend to enjoy modern media portrayals of ancient history more when they're farther away from what I'm actually studying. Uh, and again, maybe it's that I'm, I don't have that level of detailed investment in, in every little point. So I, I quite enjoyed large parts of HBO's Rome. The, there were some things that made me yell at the television. You know, there, was, there were certain portrayals, there were certain characters in it that I really liked and that I, I thought were interesting. And I loved how they used the fictional characters in the series uh, to dig into aspects of social life uh, and cultural and religious life. Again, not all of those were done with equal accuracy, um, but I thought they did some very interesting things to explore and to uh, dig into ancient worlds uh, and to lean into the unfamiliar as well as just the sort of high Shakespearean uh, portrayal of, of political figures uh, debating great principles. So for other portrayals, I mean, there are there are a handful of very good novels. I'm still, I'm partial to the old uh, Mary Renault novels, her trilogy on Alexander. I was reading those in high school. Uh, and actually her, her novel, Funeral Games, is still one of my favorite historical novels uh, that I've ever read. Uh, it's very bleak. <laughs> it's the breakup of Alexander's empire, it, it literally starts out with Alexander as a, a corpse on the table. Uh, it deals with the what we might now call the Game of Thrones-like fallout of uh, how an empire comes apart. Uh, and again, there are the focus is on the Macedonian characters, uh, but there's this larger world of the Persian Empire uh, that's been briefly conquered and then thrown into turmoil uh, by Macedonian invasion. So I think that's a great example of a really powerful, emotional, and historically uh, well done storytelling uh, that you know deals with big issues and and has uh, emotional complexity. Uh, and you know, I, I would love to see more of that. I think books have more room, more space uh, to be more accurate, right? Because you're not trying to make something that has to be done in basically two hours and that has to make a lot of money, make the budget back and appeal to people. If you're an author, you do have the time to sort of sit and do your research and put as much as you want into your fictionalized tale. So uh, I do enjoy reading historical fiction um, because, yeah, it's not it's not just straight up a history book, but it, it has more room to breathe is, is sort of how I look at them. So, yeah, I, I would like to see more. I'm sure there probably are more books that I'm just forgetting about. And that, that could also just be because I like to see warfare on screen. And it's fun to read it, but I there's something fun about watching something with elaborate sets and costumes 
flash across the screen. So, you know, maybe one day someone will do an accurate Battle of Salamis, but like really accurate that I can see on my screen. That would be quite fun. That would be fascinating to, to visualize. Uh, again, trying to visualize at least 700 triremes packed into that channel is uh, very exciting. Right, because you, you can read that and then you can get a sort of picture in your mind, but to see someone try to attempt it on screen would be a whole new dimension. So maybe that's that's what I'm going to hope for in the future. Please someone do the Battle of Salamis so I can see it on my screen. But anyway, I digress. There are so many things that hopefully will be done, could be done, should be done in media, both for the Greeks and the Persians. And a couple last questions to end the interview portion of my podcast. And that would be when you were in college or grad school, did you attend your professor's office hours? And this can be both formal or informal. Uh, I did. I, I always loved office hours. Um, it, it was a great chance to get to know the professors outside class and, and get to know, you know what they were really excited about. And, and you know, they really get the personality beyond uh, what we were doing in the classroom. So I, I may have been that slightly annoying student who uh, was always in office hours and and uh, was you know there uh, you know I'm sure my professors were very busy and we were trying to get their projects done uh, but I was so excited to be talking with them and and uh, learning more about everything that they they had to teach me and yeah it's something I love as a professor um, I feel like it's something it's a culture that's maybe suffered a little bit from the pandemic and something I've been telling my students uh, and I'm going to tell my students uh, next week as we start up classes is to take advantage of this because students haven't been coming as often as I feel they used to in the past uh, and again it, it's a great chance to develop you know to learn more about your professors and get to know them but also to develop your own ideas uh, and I think a lot of great inspirations can come out of conversation you know, beyond just the formal setting of what we're doing in a, a room where you're being evaluated. Yeah, yeah. And you can pull from any point in your life if you would like to, either as a student yourself or as a professor. But has there been anything like a particular conversation or moment or experience during an office hours conversation that you've had that you would love to share? I mean, this could be anything fun, little anecdotes, something that struck you particularly. Well, I'm trying to think. I think one that comes to mind uh, is when I was working on my senior thesis uh, as an undergrad, um, I had the uh, privilege to have the uh, university president at the time, uh, Hunter Rawlings, who was a, a classicist who uh, works on Thucydides. Uh, and he kindly agreed to be one of the readers on my thesis. And I remember this exciting and a little intimidating experience of going to the university president's office and sitting in a very nice uh, waiting room and, and and him coming out and being so gracious with his time and, and talking Thucydides with me. And again, my senior thesis was looking at the Persian element, the Persian interventions and the funding of Sparta and sort of how that played into the Greek world. But I remember this conversation with him. He'd been studying Thucydides for decades. And we were talking about the Athenian defeat in Sicily that weakened the Athenian empire and then led up to Persia coming into the war. Uh, and I remember President Rawlings saying that he still reads Thucydides book seven uh, and gets you know, chills when he reads it. Uh, and that you know when he reads as you're going towards the end game of Athens disaster in Sicily, which has been set up for two books of the histories, there's still this feeling he gets that could it possibly turn out differently this time? You know, maybe this time the Athenians won't make these mistakes. Maybe they'll actually win. Uh, and I remember that striking me as an undergrad, just the sense of the, the excitement with which a professor who had been dealing with this material for so many years could still come in and read it as if it was new. I remember that. Uh, there are so many office hours conversations that, that I could bring up, but I think that sense of the excitement still being there and the perspective for taking something new out of a text still being there when you've done it for so many years. I remember 
thinking this is the kind of professor I want to be. You know, this is the this is what I want to bring to my classes someday. So yeah, I think that that inspiration from professors that you know encouragement to immerse yourself in the ancient world is something that I found in many different ways from many mentors and professors over the years. Yeah, that's fantastic. I am all for great office hours. Anything that happens there, for the most part, I I was that student who lived in my professor's office hours. Yeah, they probably hated me because they were like, "She won't leave. Get rid of her." But yeah, yeah, no. Sure they did. Again, from the other side, I can say, you know, I I had that sense like I'm I'm the student who's always there. Maybe I shouldn't be there that much. There's, we like self interrogate a lot. But then from my perspective as a professor, I'm. You know, I love the students who are in my office hours, and I wish more of them would would be uh, coming more often. Well, I mean, you already gave a great argument, so don't feel like you need to say more. But in, usually, I kind of ask, you know, well, if you were going to pitch office hours to your students, you know, what would you tell them? So you can add on to your previous answer, or, I mean, you you covered so much of it, so it's up to you. Sure, I would say. Uh, it's important to get to know your professors. We're, we're human. And again, we really want to uh, talk with our students, not, not just talk at them, uh, but we really re- want to get to know our students as, as people. And again, it's so fun getting to know what brings students into our classes. You know, our, Do they have a love of history that they uh, have always had? Did they get a great experience studying history in high school? Or did they have questions that they always wanted to have answered that they didn't feel like they were getting the answers to in the earlier classes? Really, there's so much more that you can take out of conversations with your professor outside a formal setting. So again, I'd, I'd say, you know, go go to your office hours. Um, it's, it's one of the best parts of your education. And, it, and it's a really, it's a free add-on you're not paying for it beyond what you're doing in classes. So make the most of it. Couldn't agree more. So at the end of every podcast episode, I ask each guest if they would read Shelley's Ozymandias poem, because this is a poem that people continually cite as being a very beautifully written, elegant, very deep poem. I've heard people say it hits them kind of in the gut and it sticks with people. And there have been a ton of like cultural references made to it. And so after you've read the poem, I would be interested to hear your thoughts on whether you agree with kind of the sentiment that, you know, it is a, a particularly striking poem or whether you disagree with this sentiment. And I will screen share the poem for you so that you will be able to read it. And whenever you're ready. Okay. I met a traveler from an antique land who said... Two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor, well, those passions red which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal, these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. Thank you. That was fun. I I enjoyed uh, getting to to read that. I've always uh, had a soft spot for that poem. Kind of falls into a, another period of historical interest for me, and the, the, you know, romanticism and the early nineteenth century, and rediscoveries of the ancient world by uh, people who are immersed in empire and debates on empire in, in uh, the nineteenth century world. I think it's a great entry point. I, I think, uh, to a certain extent, it brings up this idea of the romantic fascination of antiquity. Uh, that kind of adds on to ideas about the attraction of the Gothic ruin uh, to, uh, again, Shelley and Mary Shelley and other people who are, who are writing in that period. It certainly plays on uh, orientalizing tropes that come out of Napoleon's expedition to Egypt and then uh, you know, European mania for all things Egyptian. And then that expands with 
uh, Mesopotamia and parts of the Persian world in, in the 19th century. But I do enjoy the message. Uh, I think Hamilton puts it in a different way in, in our own century with the idea that empires rise, empires fall. This, this idea of the potential comparison between historical empires and the idea that power is always finite in some sense. That's a fascinating concept that I think can can drive the historian uh, in uh, their pursuits in, in the modern day. Wow. Well, I can clearly and definitively say that I've not had anybody make a Hamilton reference to the poem before today, but I am I the first one. <laughs> but I am so happy and excited that you did. And that is a skill. It is a skill. Should have said oceans rise, empires fall. I'm realizing I misquoted it. <laughs> no, it's fine. It's you know what? It still works. It still works, and it's fabulous. So, okay, you really hit the nail on the head, though. It is. We've got themes of legacy and power and all these wonderful things. And you know, one of the reasons it is my favorite poem of all time is definitely because it's very. Pol it's a political statement by Shelley, and the sense of elegant decay, the sense of it being a memento mori, right? It's it's so striking. It's so striking. But also, the last question I ask every guest, because now we've we've read the poem and we we've sussed out the themes, and I love asking this question. If you stop and consider our current society, right, the modern world, what we are living in now, do we have a modern equivalent of an Ozymandias, like something we think is so great? that we think will be here forever. But realistically, you know, will humans like in, I don't know, 500 years from now, will they agree with us? Will they think we're crazy? Will they just be like a sh big shrug because, wow, humans? Wow, these, these are big questions. I mean, I, I hope we're all here 500 years from now. I, of course, you know, the political formations are, are going to change and shift. And it's... It's hard to imagine looking that far uh, into the future. I tend to tell my students that history provides us not necessarily a toolkit for uh, solving all the problems of the past. Uh, there tends to be this optimistic formulation that I know I was given in, in grade school um, that those who read uh, or who do not read history are, are doomed to repeat it. And I tell my students that that really goes back to Thucydides, except it it lacks the assumption that you can fix uh, the, the past. The, the original formulation in the bleak ancient Greek uh, was more that you have to understand history repeats itself and you study the past to learn what your symptoms are. You know, what dreadful condition do you have now? You can understand it more and you can know, hey, I have the plague of Athens. Um, that doesn't mean that you can fix the the ongoing problems. But I think history is capable of giving us uh, inspiration and it's capable when interpreted right of teaching civic values that I hope will continue to last and will continue to, to yield a, a positive future. In terms of Ozymandias, imperialism, I think there are going to be imperial formations to come. I think we certainly see different types of imperial behavior today, whether that's hard force or imperial influence. Um, we see competition with powers maybe aspiring to imperial roles uh, or frustrated in their loss of empire. And I think that empire as a framework for world history is a very powerful one and will certainly continue to shape our future in one way or another. Yeah. I mean, imperialism definitely works. We think back in the 19th century, it was seen as really great. And then it, the, the more we've progressed, it's like terrible, but we still do it. So humans are fascinating, aren't we? We've already seen change in not too long. <laughs> but I mean, I love where you went with the, the, the historical framework and the, the way we view and teach and consider history. Um, that's sort of a more meta answer, which I love. I love getting the big meta answers. Thank you. Again, I'm, I'm gearing up for teaching uh, as we go back to classes next week. Uh, and I, I teach a, an introductory world history class. It's part of our, our liberal learning core. Uh, so one of the things on the first day is the sales pitch. 
Uh, and why should you be in this class? You, you can get your global multicultural requirement fulfilled through any number of classes on, on our list. Uh, but I try to let them know why it's actually really valuable for them if, if they stay. Uh, and what can they get out of it besides three credits? They, you know what, the, I think that the best selling point is you should be in this class because it's fun, because the, the ancient world is fun to study. That, that should just be the mic drop moment. And when they say, what do you mean it's fun? And then you go, just watch, just, just stay for the class and you'll see it's really fun. And they'll go, oh my gosh. Yeah. So, so you, it's like a, you know, like be mysterious about it. That's how I would pitch it, but maybe that would not get me good enrollment if I were teaching a class I, like I, that. I try to do the fun side too. <laughs> I, I always try to share at least one weird story right off the bat to hook them in. Yes. <laughs> Issues and, and also sort of bizarre, dark historical comedy. <laughs> All you got to do is get into some of the weird, crazy mythology stories, and then people are hooked. I mean, you know, you just need like that one crazy story. And then people are like, yep, I want to keep learning. It's, it works, I think. Anyway, I did kind of lie. There is one final question I'm going to ask you, but it's very, it's really not hard. And it is where can people find you and your work if they would like to, to go and learn more? Thank you so much. Um, well, I'm a, a professor at Christopher Newport University, uh, and you can go to CNU's uh, website and their history department page, and I have a, a, a profile there. I also keep a, an active profile on academia.edu, where uh, I post a number of my uh, shorter publications, uh, uh, articles, and, and conference papers. And my first book, uh, Persian Interventions, is uh, from Johns Hopkins University Press. You can look on their uh, press website uh, or at uh, various uh, bookstores and online booksellers uh, to find copies of that. And I have two more books that uh, are hopefully coming out in the next few years. Uh, I'm uh, co-editing uh, a volume uh, for the uh, for Brill Publishers uh, called Brill's Companion to War in the Ancient Iranian Empires, uh, and that is hopefully due out next year in 2024. Uh, and uh, I'm writing uh, a book called Persia's Greek Campaigns, uh, looking at uh, Darius and Xerxes uh, and the broader background and imperial context uh, for uh, Persian imperialism. Uh, and that will hopefully come out uh, in 2025. Wonderful. Well, we will make sure to link your academia page and your faculty page to the show notes, as well as a link to finding your first book. And then hopefully once the new books come out, we can sort of go back and, and link those in as well. So thank you. thank you so much again for coming to join me on the podcast. It's It's been a, a pleasure to be able to talk to you. Thank you. You too. Uh, it, it was a, a great opportunity to be on your show and I really enjoyed it. Trireme Transit is now departing ancient office hours. Next stop is Present Ponderings.